Okay, so let's go to our chapter. We're at three, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the topic today is attributes. So the the non-spatial aspects of geospatial data. And so we'll uh, explore the attributes, um, do some manipulation. Um, I made some notes just about how I pulled this down, put in some pictures, but um, essentially what the example they give in the book is of a bus stop. So um, any spatial entity, um, like a location, uh, the, the usefulness of that is its association with non-spatial information like uh, a number like uh, latitude, longitude, or the name of the bus stop, uh, maybe the elevation above sea level, maybe the bus ridership arriving and departing by hour, or the cost to build the bus stop, or uh, some economic number like GDP or temperature seasonally. So our, our say, data frame will have a, a a linked combination of um, a geospatial aspect and then a whole bunch of other data features, um, which, which they're calling attributes. Um, so they divide, uh, I think consistently through the whole book, uh, vector objects, which are really, um, say polygons or points, versus raster objects, which are grids. And in vector objects, we lean really heavily on the SF package, the, the, its shape files. And the SF package um, makes a data frame. It, in fact, it's still a data frame. It just adds an additional class with a sticky um, class column with the geographic entities. So. As a result, the manipulations we could do on a data frame, we can do on a SF object. Um, the SF package is uh, huge with more than a hundred methods. Um, just to highlight a few that we'll cover. Um, so the SF package has methods that look like uh, base R functions like aggregate, R bind, C bind, and merge. The SF package also has methods where we can filter on SF objects or select like we can in dplyr, group by, do joins, or, or even mutate uh, the way we can in, in dplyr. And um, so that extends tidyverse functionality. And to prove that, you can you can say methods and class equals SF and and get this huge list of 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 functions. Um, I wanted to note here that the SF package has a wonderful cheat sheet. There's links to blogs and articles and a and a really nice set of quick start, quick start articles and and the SF package website is really well thought out. Uh, to demonstrate uh, some of what SF does, we're going to uh, pull in a world data set, just as he did in the book. The uh, SP data world data set, when you say class on that data object, it is an SF object, but it's also a data frame at the same time. It's a two-dimensional object. Um, so it's, it's got 177 rows or, or countries as it were, and 11 data columns. Um, right away here to demonstrate, so the world is an SF object, but there's a function called drop geometry. If you run drop geometry on world, it strips away that SF, C sticky column. So all you have left is the 10 data columns.
All right, other functionality on SF objects or, or uh, vector objects, um, subsetting. So uh, we could look at uh, first a set of rows in base R, we, we just use the parentheses or the brackets, excuse me, brackets to grab the first six rows, for example. And to get world rows one through six, we will just print that to the to the console here to subset rows by position. Um, we could also subset columns by position in base R, and this grabs uh, ISO name long and continent. And note the um, so the the three columns included um, will not st strip away the sticky. Uh, SFC column. So that comes along for the ride, even though we've only picked these three columns. So there's actually four columns. We could also subset by rows and columns by position. So we get the first six rows, three columns, one through three, plus the sticky geometry column. Um, also in base R, you could also subset columns by name, um, but you've got to uh, 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 make a, a name, say a name vector to get name long and population. Here again, the sticky column comes along for the right. And you could also subset by logical indices, so true false, and, and you could, pick off true, true to get the first two columns, false to drop several, and then true, true, false, false. So we get the first and the second and uh, the sixth or the seventh columns to come along. Um, this is one thing, um, well, I, I cheated a little bit to make the R markdown here. Um, you could also try to pick a non-existing column and the error you get is that the column doesn't exist. This, this will not run. So when you try to subset on a column, it doesn't exist. It uh, smartly uh, errors out and stops the, the, the run. As we mentioned up above, we could also use a logical vector for subsetting. Uh, this statement, is a logical. So this is where um, in the world data set, those rows where area KM2 is under 10,000, um, in this vector of area KM2, um, 177 rows are there, 170 of them will come back false. They're above 10,000, but seven of them will come back true as shown here. So this, this I small is 177 trues and falses. And that I small vector of logical statements can be put in the rows of the world. And we could then get the list of what amounts to small countries. Another way of doing the pretty much the exact same thing is to use base R subset. Put the logical statement here, which gives a vector of true falses and the world um, data frame, and that will provide the subset back of the seven small countries. Switching gears, and this may be more common, I think, for the folks on this. Um, uh, in this forum, uh, we can use dplyr on columns. Uh, select obviously is is the verb here in dplyr, and uh, when we put in the data frame and then the names of the column, um, I guess what we get back is is the name long and the population and the sticky column. The geometry comes back even in dplyr. 
We could also select a range of columns. So everything between name long and population in the data frame. And so uh, there's name long and population and it picks up continent, region, subregion type area um, because they're, they're situated. Uh, uh, these are a sequence of, of columns next to one another. In dplyr, we can also remove a column and get everything except these two columns. And uh, I think a useful note here, I use this all the time where uh, dplyr select also works with a number of helper functions uh, like contain starts with uh, num range and other uh, tidy select um, um, uh, uh, say verbs to to collect. If you've got uh, dozens or hundreds of columns and you want to use a more um, concise uh, uh, statement to pick a subset of columns. Uh, dplyr also works on rows. Um, we'll get to filter in a moment, but um, slice and the slice group of um, uh, dplyr verbs uh, allow us to get a sample of columns or the head or the tail, uh, slice max, slice min, slice sample. In this case, slice head grabs the top, uh, the, the first six columns in the data frame. Filter, of course, uh, requires a call statement. Uh, sometimes it has the double equals, sometimes it's greater than or less than. Um, but like we had shown in BASAR, this, this is the, the, say, the small countries of the world using the dplyr filter statement. Um, besides the tidy select verbs, uh, another, um, I think, nice aspect of dplyr is allowing the use of the pipe. And at the moment, there's two pipes, uh, the McGritter pipe and the Basar pipe. Uh, maybe should ask, um, what's, uh, what's the consensus here? Are, are, are folks using Basar pipe or, or the McGritter pipe? What, what, do, what do you all use? Basar right pipe when I'm three point, uh, greater than four point one, I think. And, yeah. and some, it depends on what I'm doing, uh, and but yeah, I tend to try to use the the base R pipe. Okay, so it's fine using boss, I guess. What I'm trying to avoid is using boss in the same script, <laughs> 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 just for like because I'm not chaotic evil enough. Tony, which pipe do you use? I'm a greater one. Um only recently learning this stuff. So the, the base R coming back and being used is relatively new to me. So I haven't, uh, you know, ch changed over yet, but I use the one with the, you know, the keyboard shortcut uh, in our studio, yeah. which is set for Magritte when you put the tidyverse on, right? Yeah, I, I changed the default, but yeah, everybody, I mean, has the reasons. Derek, which pipe do you use? I've been switching over to the base R pipe because I just thought that was where the trend was going. But as with a lot of people here, whenever my students look up examples, it's as the Magritte pipe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Aluafemi, uh, which pipe do you use? May I use uh, the base R pipe? Yeah. Okay. You've 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 uh, you're on the new one. And Trevin, which pipe do you use? I've been switching over to the um, the base. Um, mm -hmm. I have a special font that I use that looks like a triangle. Yeah. Okay. I like <clears throat> okay. I I know of a few in the community who who still don't like pipes at all, and and so this is a, a little bit of style. There there are some advantages. Um, but I, I, I do think with people coming from SQL or Python, um, the sort of chaining of, you know, people adapt to this pretty readily. So 
Uh, it's good, good, good discussion. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Go ahead. I think it depends on what you do. On quick analysis, I like them. You know, like when I was like, let's say, unique something and I want to view, then I pipe into view, you know, and then it pop up like the kind of the spreadsheet or whatever. I like yeah. piping. Uh, I'm piping a lot into view or piping a lot into like uh, some stuff. When I'm working, writing function, I tend to prefer like being slow uh, just because like sometimes you are, yeah, it's easier to debug, I would say. I mean, it's not that difficult to debug, but uh, yes, I try to avoid pipe when I'm writing some, let's say, function. And when I'm doing a full data analysis and I just care about like uh, producing an output, um, I'm going all the way with pipe, I think. Yeah. This is my use, but yeah. That's good. Good discussion. Okay. Uh, and yeah, Derek, I agree. Like, uh, even the placeholders, like uh, the underscore, I guess, is the the plus the new pipe placeholders. This is not like plenty that does not work with it. You're right. Like, so the, there is a there is a nice new um, equivalent to uh, say a Python lambda function that I'm that I've begun to use, and so I'm I'm even easing into the the new base R pipe and uh, and the new functional language. Okay, good, good discussion. All right, so we'll move on in vector objects yet to summarize or aggregation. Um, so when we group, um, huh, one thing we have to be careful of, there is a stats aggregate. Um, so there's a non SF aggregate. And in many cases, these grouping functions can be done with a a non-geospatial aware function. And if we aggregate, um, say, a population by continent and do a sum, um, what we get back is just population by continent. It's, it's got no um, sticky geometry column. Um, in fact, the class of what we get back is just a data frame. But um, SF does provide an aggregate in the package. It's, it's called aggregate.sf. So in these S3 objects, the SF package offers an aggregate method. Um, so this aggregate is the aggregate from the SF package. And um, it's... <laughs> Um, so when, when um, and in fact, I could have been more clear on here if I said SF dot dot or colon colon aggregate, um, but it, it's smart enough to pick this up based on the, the, um, the world data frame being an SF package. And so the, the class of this object is both a data frame and an SF object with, with the eight rows from above. I kind of wish I would have printed it out. It would have had column or continent population and and then the continent geometry yet. And There's a deep the syntax and the uh, table syntax. Yeah, yeah. There is a deep layer equivalent and and uh, in fact there's a new deep layer 1.1 which um, the by verb has changed a little bit, but um, in dplyr we can we can take the world data frame. We can tell to 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 add a, a say group by flag on continent to world, and then summarize by continent population for a sum. Um, it spits out a bunch of warnings, um, which which is uh, interesting in the SF. Uh, package. So as it's trying to aggregate this, it's, it's, um, it's redoing the geometry object and making some union assumptions that we're going to get to in the next chapter about how to stitch together the country geometries that were in the original data frame, which, which we'll get to soon. So the, the class of the dplyr object that's been aggregated is still an SF object and a data frame 
with, with the uh, eight continents. Um, the author of the book really believes there's some benefits in terms of readability and control, especially over the new column names. So in dplyr, you can rename your groups and rename your sums. Um, in fact, an example of method chaining in dplyr is is here, which which is uh, which is kind of fun, where you can drop the geometry and select columns, group by, summarize, mutate even, which we'll get to in a moment. So you can create a whole new column, and then just pick the top three and arrange them in descending order. And it's it's just beautiful. Um. Also in the vector objects, we can do joints. Um, so these are like SQL joins. Um, really like in the new dplyr, the uh, vignette called two table. If people are confused about full joins, inner joins, left joins, anti joins, um, there's a nice overview in the two table vignette. Um, so what the author's done is combine data on coffee production with the world data set. The, the coffee production table is just coffee production. There's, there's no geospatial aspects. The world data set has the, has the maps. So when we look at the class of coffee table, our coffee data, it is, it is just a data frame. So when we left join, we'll get all of the, and the order is important. So we can get all of the SF world data frame and those coffee data entries that match in a world coffee data frame. And uh, it's nice you get this message that it's joining by name long because both of these data frames have columns called name long. The class of the new entity is both SF and data frame, but that's because the first item is an SF item. If we reverse these, we don't get this outcome. In fact, as an example down here, if we put coffee data first and world and make the join, we, we don't get an SF object. So the, the SF object has to be first to preserve the sticky geometry column. Uh, then I went on a little bit of an adventure. Instead of using a base plot, I made a GG plot. So this this world coffee up above this SF object. Um, conveniently, um, if, if we take the world, world coffee SF object and tell it to fill by the coffee production column, so the colors by column, and, and make it geom SF, geom SF is smart enough to find the geometry column. I, uh, I made the fill just this, this three color fill, the minimal, made a table and, and got a nice little map of 27's, 2017's coffee production. I think this is intuitive that, that Brazil is by far the biggest producer of coffee globally. Um, the author, uh, talks at length about joining on a key variable that has to be um, called in both data sets. And we can, um, we can uh, if, if, if the variable, if the join has to be told what the variables are, you can do that. But um, by default, dplyr tries to match or join by the variables with matching names. And I won't get into the details um, there's a lot of great information in the dplyr vignette. Um, okay, so the mutate. Um, we can create and remove attributes. So these, um, 
these pieces of data in the world, um, you know, we can create a new one called population density by dividing population by the area, and then and then select on those columns. And uh, um, here again, we get the name long, so the individual countries and the population density. And and I guess there's even some NAs where um, I'm guessing. Uh, either population or, or area was missing, but the polygon is sticky. It continues to go through even after the mutate. Uh, beyond dplyr in the tidyr package, there's also unite, unite and separate, where we can um, essentially paste the uh, uh, information in two columns together. So in this case, by uniting, um, say under this this new column name, we can we can paste continent and region with a colon between them. And then we can take the same data frame and say tidy I or separate that uh, con region entity, we separate continent region and <laughs> define the separator as a colon and it splits those columns back apart with the sticky column still in place. So that's all the vector objects. We're gonna switch gears now. Um, and uh, um, where vector objects are, are like a pen plotter, they're drawing curves and lines and points, a raster or a, a TIFF is um, a grid. So satellite imagery or um, imagery taken with your um, Nikon camera, um, or other imagery, you know, there's some compression or other things happening, but in its in its original form, off of the um, off of the camera, there there are little um, sensing things on the CCD on the on the sensor that capture, say, light, and and maybe in different color layers, but uh, a a raster object is essentially a grid of, of dots or tiles, and those tiles are numbers. And at, at its very simplest, a raster object like, like this thing is, is a set of rows and columns with, with values, in this case depicted as colors. And, and I've plotted a raster that is a contrived um, you know, very simple raster object. Um, so, so these things, um, of course, have attribute data, like like the the name of the color in the grid. Um, but it's it's a much different sort of set of attributes than vector objects. Uh, raster objects can contain categorical values. Um, yeah. So here's maybe a soil profile where um, each square could either be clay, silt, or sand in in terms of a you know a, a, a landform or a soil sample over a, a landscape. So the raster object in the header carries a lookup table as a list of data frames. And if you say cats on the raster object in the raster package, you'll get the information on the lookup table. Um, subsetting a raster object is really picking the corner of the grid, the row or the column of the grid. And you could even uh, replace a value in that grid point. So here, <laughs> I put a white square in position three, three.
Um, so the Terra package um, contains a lot of functions for extracting descriptive statistics for rasters. If you've got satellite imagery and want cloud cover or other things, there's the, the math is, is executed through Terra. Summary operations like standard deviation or other summary statistics can be calculated with global. And, and there's also a, a freak function that'll give you a frequency table of how often those categorical values appear in the frame that you're looking at. So as an example, here's a summary of, of those raster squares. Here's uh, a global view of standard deviation of the raster squares and a frequency table of the different values that were in that rectangle up above that we created. So raster value statistics can be visualized in a whole bunch of ways. Um, this is base R functionality, but uh, there's, we could also use ggplot. Uh, I didn't have the time, but we could look at a box plot of all the tiles in that rectangle um, to, to show the, the box plot of the continuous values or uh, uh, density plot or, or uh, histogram here at the frequency plot with the hist. And that's the chapter. Um, questions or comments? Nice job, Jim. Great work. Yeah. Huh. You raised the bar for me now. <laughs> I have to no, follow. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. It's yeah. it's not so bad if 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 you can pull the new version of the book and and I'll get this pushed out to John Harmon tonight yet likely with the uh, whenever the video link is available I'll paste it in I'll push it to John Harmon when he approves it you can pull the new book and um, yeah it's not too bad ask Thank questions you. though if if you get stuck don't don't be don't sweat ask ask a question we'll help you out um, yeah it's all good yeah, just yeah. One, one point, like in the book, uh, column data are called attributes. Sometimes mm -hmm. they call fields, uh, yeah. especially like, you know, they're like, and, and the statistician guy can call them viable if they use it for models. This is like some common term, like you can see also like sometimes. And if you came from the GIS world, like probably the fields uh, name is more common, I feel. Um, attributes, I, I like attribute too, but uh, uh, with R, like also you can name object with attributes, which is with them become like you can be confused because it's not exactly the same ID, I think. But yeah, it's you know, like uh, yeah, like people said, like naming uh, stuff in computer science is probably one of the <laughs> hardest stuff. It gets when we're in S3 objects, the which which is the majority of R. I think we're safe, um, right? When we get into S4 objects or uh, shiny um, things, right, right. There's there's actually a thing called a attributes that's yeah. that is different. Yeah, that's um, just like so. Yeah, if if some people say I mean know it or say it like that's why like some some term can be like a bit confusing i mean not confusing but can be used in other contexts or be be mindful of that that's all i have to think now uh, you can name stuff with aggregate which is uh not great <laughs> i will say i use it but uh it's I, uh, definitely it's easier like with uh, deploy verbs yeah you do not need like to remember uh, I think like in aggregates, uh, in formula syntax, it's different than it tables, uh, data frame syntax, it's a mess. So yeah, as a beginner, I will totally recommend and use Deplier, I think. 
it's more intuitive. But sometimes, you know, you do not want to rely on it and then you use aggregate and works fine. Yeah, what's, what's, I, yeah, you, you need like to come, I mean, it's also an intuitive because you need to list the, um, where you want to aggregate and combine, not C bind uh, the one. And it's inside of the C bind that you name it, like a data frame, basically, which is, yeah, Dplyr is more consistent, I would say. Yeah, so the stuff like, no, it, awesome. I have nothing to say. Like, I, I think it's make like, I don't know, like, if you are like um, familiar, but it's super easy to go fast. Like um, this is like the, just merging or merge also work like the base R uh, um, kind of uh, because it does everything. It's the left join, inner join, um, the base. Uh, but it, it's like you are you have plenty of argument to do it. Uh, yeah, merge also work. But I think this is one good point. Like, and I think I understand like the um, some at, at first I was confused with this sticky colon. And then when you practice, you tend to like it a lot. Like, uh, and I just sometimes um, remember to draw because like uh, it on on the, um, on the world that I set, it's 100 something polygon. So it's super fast. But if you work on like, let's say 10K polygons and you just care like about the aggregate and do not care like it's because like what's the aggregate do is merging it will unionize this is why you have the error i mean not the error the warning saying like oh i'm not sure if i um unionize correctly because it's that long system and yeah in this case like dropping the geometry uh because will make your calculate faster and then you can always like merge or join or whatever it, it's a bit of gymnastic, but uh, it's not hard. I don't know what to think about it, but yeah. So I dropped a lot of the geometry. Sometimes. One thing like that you can also drop by attributing null to the colon. I think it will drop the geometry colon, unsure, but it is, this is bad practice. <laughs> Because then uh, you are passing the null and it's can it's very difficult to debug. So the ST drop, uh, the using a function will save life, save your life. I mean not your life, but maybe one day of debugging. <laughs> so the book used the correct method, but like you can see, like in some tutorials that say like just attribute null to it, and this is bad. I don't know. Uh, do do some of people have used the SP package? Um, I struggled with it um, yeah. in the past. I was frustrated, and and uh, well, part of my interest in this book was because of that. That um, the pathways to getting things done um, with SP there seemed to be quite a few obstacles in getting set up. Um, getting the, say, the data in a useful format that I, that I could operate on, um, some of the other aspects with the projection were harder to deal with. And, and um, so far, I'm liking what I see in SF, that they've abstracted some of the unnecessary complexity away. Um, 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 but yeah, S SP was, um, um, was 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 harder to work with. Yeah, one hundred percent. What was SP at S four, um, yeah. not S three? That okay. That was the other. So the at sign, um, getting at the objects inside of it was um, weird. Yeah. 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 It's it's a lot of complexity. The like you can think of shapefile as the model of it. So like shapefile, you have like a file that's have like the, that draw the geometry. You have a file that's usually a DBF file that's contain the attribute. Then you have like an indexes that's basically like match. Uh, and it was the same like with the 
as I mean the SP object, like you basically like need to have an indexes that uh, match. Um, but I mean the data, I mean the attribute and the geometry. I mean it makes it sense at time, I guess, because um, and also it have other attribute like the bounding box, the project uh, for string, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, it was difficult. I agree with you. So the SF is definitely like a plus, even if it's still a huge package and people like complain a bit uh, about its modularity. Because like it, it does a bit of everything and it's difficult like to update or whatever. But like for I think for users' perspective, this is a great package. <laughs> but yeah, you know, like this is also because like so the sticky column is a list column, which right. is recent in the R history. It did yep. not exist before, like I think like seven or eight years ago. That's why like uh inside of the data um that i mean you could always have a data frame that uh that can contain list but it wasn't tidy and i think like at one point i'd let think it make it sense to have like the tidy with a list we will see that on the chapter so Tony will present like the how do you represent like a spatial object into like this sticky column and uh, yeah but uh, sp is still used sadly uh, mostly, uh, if you are dealing with statistics, a uh, lot of a uh, lot of statistical package have not been updated. I mean, special statistic, and then you can convert like I think it's as uh, open parentheses like special uh, and the object, and you get the st object. I mean, sp object, and I think sf as a function that's called st as sf that's identify it and convert it. So do not be afraid if you um, miss it. But yeah, there's still quite a lot like uh, of people that have like, I don't know, found a tutorial on SP and yeah, get lost. <laughs> it's easy. And also like, yeah, it use over as a function also like, you know, uh, before like doing like, let's say like, um, we will do like special predicate the first predicate is like, does it match? And then what we do with what it match? So it's it's kind of like separate every task, which uh, as you said, like SF make, uh, it's an abstraction useful for users, I think. But yeah, uh, that's it. I mean, I'm, I'm so bad at uh, raster, so I'm sad that I can't discuss it, but like, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, raster is a very nice uh, format. Um, like we'll see Grass, uh, G R I S S, which is like a very old software. Like it was, I mean, it's not that I mean, it has been updated, but it was de developed by the U.S. Army Corps, I think. No, uh, and it's 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 used extensively raster formats because at that at, it's still true. Like it's way less computational intensive that's dealing with geometry. So sometimes it makes sense to use the resters even if you have like geometry. Because, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to those chapters. Yeah, it will be good chapters. Gra Grass is a super nice, uh, I think like, uh, yeah, I I'm sad that it did not win uh, the, uh, the, let's say like, uh, it was less user-friendly like uh, S3. But uh, it definitely that uh, it's uh, it has some inter it does some interesting stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Do others like have? Did you try exercise? I I didn't this time, but they're not so difficult in this oh. chapter. Um, I so I, I scanned them and didn't think they would add a lot of value. Um, but I I think for the people doing the chapters. It, it would encourage you to look at what's there and if there's something interesting. Um, yeah, they, they build your muscle memory, I think. The one with rasters, I feel was a bit like uh, lost, but yeah, the, the one like if you pro, if you practice a lot, like they, they will go. They, they also like introduce like other, other, like you mentioned, like different kind of join and stuff like that. So they are mostly here, like, but if you know them, you know them. So <laughs> yeah. yeah.
well great i think we're good like unless other like have question anybody javin derek or lafomain no okay the the sf by the way when i was checking your presentation have a triangulate function so maybe I can try using it, like see how it works. If I can split the polygon with it by uh, and doing like some mesh, <laughs> I will I will I will check that. And yeah, cool. well, I'll see you next week and uh, have a good weekend. Bye have everyone and weekend. thanks for presenting. Bye -bye. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Yep. Thanks all. Have a good thanks night. So. Great. Thanks, Jeff.